It is a tremendous honor to welcome Noam Chomsky on this podcast. Um, he is the first guest who I have the honor to say needs no introduction. How are you today, Noam? Thank you for joining this show. Pleased to be with you. So uh, I would like to begin by asking you, um, given your decades long career in academia, philosophy and politics, you're still putting out work and you're still contributing to the political slash philosophical discourse of today. So I wonder uh, what is the, I guess, the secret sauce to your longevity and perseverance? The only thing I know is the significance of the issues in all the domains in which I try to work, the professional ones, the political ones, and so on. It's uh, enough of an it's more than enough incentive to keep going. So what are some of the issues that concern you the most uh, today? Well, the human species right now is facing questions that have never arisen in all of history or prehistory. Will the human experiment on Earth continue or will it end in an inglorious disaster, which we are soon facing? Uh, there are, as I'm sure you know, the famous doomsday clock of the bullet of atomic scientists has moved to 90 seconds before midnight. One, because of the increasing threat of nuclear war, both in Europe and in Asia. Second, because of the uh, unwillingness of power systems to confront an environmental catastrophe that is becoming very imminent. The most recent uh, report of the IPCC, the UN group of scientists who regularly issue analyses of the state of the environment, uh, the last one a few days ago, they stopped uh, mincing words, saying straight out what is well understood, that we have maybe a couple of decades in which there's a possibility of fending off utter catastrophe. And if we don't take it, it's we hit irreversible tipping points. And from there, it's on to devastation of the prospects for organized human life on Earth. I don't see how there can be more important questions than these. <laughs> yes, and I should like to focus on the two um, commemorations of uh, that the US is having today. The more notable one is the 20th anniversary of the uh, US entry into Iraq, technically the second entry. Um, so, uh, but I would like to link it to the that other second commemoration that most people are not talking about. Um, I should say, because I'm Vietnamese, I, I remember it very well. Um, January the 27th of um, 50 years ago, 1973, is the signing of the Paris Peace Accords, which um, supposedly ended the war in Vietnam, whereas in actuality, it only ended US involvement in it. Um, I wonder, where were you when uh, the Accords were signed, and what did you make of it at that time? At the time, I hoped in the back of my mind that this would lead to an end of the war, but I presumed that it probably wouldn't, because I assumed that Kissinger and Nixon would work to find ways to try to undermine the Accords and to ensure that uh, the US would maintain a, a powerful uh, uh, military client state in South Vietnam, which in fact turned out to be the case. Take a look at the, I wrote about it right at the time. I wouldn't change what I wrote now. Uh, the uh, Accords, if you look at them, called for 
a dual authority in South Vietnam, the Saigon government, the US client, and the provisional revolutionary government, the PRG, which is basically the National Liberation Front of South Vietnam. They were to be two parallel and equivalent authorities. The United States pledged not to interfere to, uh, as they worked out their internal affairs for South Vietnam. Well, the US at once began to interfere. Uh, I was writing about it a few months later, already the signs were quite evident that the US was going to interfere to try to undermine the PRG to strengthen the client to regime to take over South Vietnam. And I assumed at the time, rightly as it turned out, that sooner or later there would be a reaction to this and the war would go on. And probably the South Vietnamese government would collapse. It was mostly a shell. And then North Vietnam would take over South Vietnam. The National Liberation Front would be marginalized or destroyed. Unfortunately, that's pretty much what happened. So are the, com are the comparisons of Saigon in 75 and Kabul 2021, are they warranted or do you see like key differences in those two occasions? They're very similar and we can add a third one, very recent. Uh, when the huge Iraqi army uh, armed and trained by the United States was faced by small number of uh, ISIS guerrillas racing at them in pickup trucks and waving rifles. Uh, the officers fled, soldiers threw down their arms, ran away. Uh, it was only Iranian-backed militias that saved Baghdad from being uh, conquered by ISIS. There's three cases, major armies, armed and funded by the United States, huge uh, development, very quickly collapsed as soon as they were faced by any, in the case of any significant enemy, in the case of uh, uh, Vietnam, that was actually a major army, in the other two cases, very little, but they collapsed. And what that shows in the three cases is what you should understand, it's very hard for a colonial imperial power to organize popular support for its enterprise. You can make it look on paper, but it's not going to work. They don't have the spirit, they don't have the commitment, doesn't matter how many arms and tanks they have. Uh, the, uh, these three rather dramatic cases of this, the situations differed in a number of ways, but there was some similarity. So today, um, this year also marks the one year anniversary. Um, I hate bringing up anniversaries, but they occur um, of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And I find that in the first three or so months, um, there were some, there were a broad consensus that you know, Russia was a bad guy, Ukraine is a good guy. <clears throat> but as the months drag on and bodies begin to pile up, um, we begin to see a fatigue in most Western nations. Um, is there any way in which um, the US and the West in general can prevent further catastrophic loss of life uh, in this particular uh, war? Yes, the West could join the rest of the world, the global south, which is most of the world, uh, India, Indonesia, South Africa, Brazil, on and on, uh, they're overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly calling for uh, China as well, for some form of negotiated settlement, diplomatic settlement to avert worse catastrophes. United States and Britain are opposed. Europe, is, for the moment, is going along with the United States and Britain. US policy is the war should continue to severely weaken Russia. 
what happens to Ukraine will be a disaster probably. What's happening to much of the rest of the world is considerable suffering in the South, loss of the curtailment of grain and fertilizer shipments is quite serious, causing lots of humanitarian problems, hunger, starvation. There is the constant threat of escalation to nuclear war. Uh, the US position is, uh, as I said, we must severely weaken Russia. And there is an argument behind it. It says, well, we have to support Ukraine until it's in a better negotiating position. Who says it's going to be in a better negotiating position? As the war continues in a kind of a stalemate, the chances are that both sides will suffer severely. But you look at the comparison of the two sides, uh, suffering in Ukraine is much more significant. They don't have the reserves and the background and the background forces that Russia can call on. So I don't see any force in the argument that sustaining the war will put Ukraine in a better negotiating position, probably the opposite. But either way, it means maintaining the destruction, the slaughter, the increasing uh, devastation of Ukrainian infrastructure, uh, increasing the suffering of the rest of the world, continuing to increase the threat of nuclear war, mo probably most serious of all, reversing the limited efforts to deal with the looming environmental crisis. Uh, all of this follows from in, uh, rejecting the decisions, the conclusions of the large majority of the world who want to move towards negotiation and settlement and insisting on maintaining the war in order to severely weaken Russia. You have to remember that from the US point of view, a narrow point of view, it's kind of a bargain. And this has been discussed in Western military circles for a small portion of the colossal US military budget. The United States is severely degrading the military forces of its major military antagonist. It's a bargain, ugly bargain. But I to get back to the question, oh. is there an way to, is there a possible way to get out of this? Yes, the way that almost the entire world is calling for. Mm -hmm. So um, I believe that the common threat that belies, I guess, the U.S.'s failure in Vietnam and in Iraq and, you know, I, fingers crossed, hopefully not the failure in Ukraine, is Woodrow Wilson and Wilsonianism. Um, both all presidents since Wilson, conservatives and liberals alike, espouse a form of Wilsonianism or another. I believe your con conception of, pol of uh, U.S. foreign policy Ideally, it's not, I guess, as uh, as world encompassing as such. So, uh, uh, what do you believe uh, are the folly, so to speak, of Wilsonianism, and in what way should the foreign policy of the United States be grounded on? Well, when you talk about Wilsonianism, you're talking about rhetoric and ideology. There's a rhetorical claim that the United States is uniquely dedicated to peace and justice and uh, all sorts of wonderful things. Uh, nothing new about that. Every imperial power before us has said exactly the same thing. The British, uh, while they were carrying out monstrous atrocities in India, Africa, Asia, we're talking about how magnificent and angelic they are. Uh, the French were carrying out a civilizing mission while the leading general was saying we have to exterminate everyone in Algeria. Uh, Hitler, if you look at his rhetoric, 
full of wonderful things that he's going to do for all the world. They're invaded. He had to force to invade Poland in order to defend ourselves from the wild terror of the Poles. If we had records from Attila the Hun, we'd probably hear the same thing. So you're talking about the rhetoric. The rhetoric is very common among international relations specialists, uh, other ideologists. Uh, there's an alternative to looking at the, uh, at the rhetoric, namely looking at the facts. Wilson was a brutal, vicious interventionist. Before, in 1915, the United States was not a major actor in the world then. It was mostly Western Hemisphere, where his actions were grotesque. Invaded Haiti in 1915, threw out the parliamentary regime, killed Marines, killed probably 15,000 people, reinstituted virtual slavery, disbanded the parliament because it refused to pass uh, US legislation allowing US corporations to buy up the country, then ran through a, a fake vote in which they 99% accepted the US demands, left the country with a murderous National Guard that tortured it for the next several decades. That's Woodrow Wilson not the Wilsonian rhetoric. That's the policies. Uh, the, as I say, the US was not then a major actor in the international affairs. Uh, domestically, Wilson came into office on a, a pacifist program. 1916, he was saying what we need, we don't want to be involved in European wars. Uh, we want uh, what he called peace without victory. It was a pacifist country then. Nobody wanted to be involved in these European mass slaughters. Well, Wilson organized a huge propaganda campaign, which within about two years had turned the country into uh, uh, fanatics who wanted to destroy everything German and uh, the opposite of his program. Well, that's Wilson. Also launched uh, the most vicious repression in American history, Red Scare, murderous repression, destroyed the labor movement, mass attacks against Afro-Americans, lynching, killings, and so on, uh, destroyed the small socialist party permanently, uh, ended independent thought. That's Woodrow Wilson. That's the policies. The rhetoric, of course, is very pretty, Wilsonian idealism and so on. But uh, the United States has never had any more commitment to these rhetorical ideals than any other imperial power. Look at that. In fact, when you talk about Vietnam as being a failure, which is the standard view, that's a rather limited view. You look back at the Original, we have a great, one of the great things about the United States is a very open society. We have a lot more information about US planning and thinking than other countries do. Uh, so you know pretty much what the thinking was. Go back to the early 50s. That's when policies were set. There were serious rational imperialist policies that led the United States to support the French effort to reconquer its former colony, and when the French failed to take it over ourselves, the rational planning was explained carefully. It's, uh, they were concerned that successful independent development in Vietnam could be what Henry Kissinger later called a virus that might infect others, might spread contagion. Others might follow the same path. The US system of domination of Asia might begin to erode, might in fact even reach Japan. Uh, John Dower, one of the main uh, Asia historians in the United States, had called it Japan the super domino, was concerned that Japan might accommodate to 
an independent South, South, Southeast Asia becoming its technological and uh, uh, industrial center, um, excluding the United States. The United States had fought the Second World War in the Pacific to prevent that. In the early 1950s, they were not willing to lose the Second World War. What do you do when you have a virus that might spread contagion? You destroy the virus, you inoculate the potential victims by imposing vicious, brutal dictatorships to prevent the spread of any ideas of independent nationalism. That was achieved. Vietnam was devastated. It's not going to be a model for anybody. Virus was destroyed. Uh, the United States succeeded in imposing monstrous dictatorships in all the countries of the region, Thailand, Burma, now Myanmar, uh, 1965, Indonesia with huge massacres, strongly supported by the United States, uh, no spread of the virus. So what kind of a defeat was it? Actually, it was success. If you look at imperial policy, it wasn't a total success. The United States did not succeed in turning Vietnam into the Philippines. Okay, it wasn't that kind of success. But the major policies were achieved. Okay. Right. Um, so I, I I get the impression uh, that, you know, uh, hearing you speak as well as hearing every other lecture that you made is that you have a you have a great ability to remember these historical details as if they happened just yesterday. And I, I my question now is that uh, what is the importance of, uh, I guess, history and remembering it, of having a historical perspective, so to speak? Well, Gore Vidal, great novelist and animal essayist, once described the United States as the United States of amnesia. That's very convenient. If you forget the history, then you can believe the rhetoric. Uh, same with Britain. Uh, after, it's very striking to see what's happening in Britain. It has an absolutely hideous imperial record. Shocking, disgusting record. Mostly suppressed. Only now, the last couple of years, after hundreds of years, literally, uh, the British are beginning to, British historians and analysts are beginning to expose the miserable British record. In France, it hasn't even yet happened. They refuse to look at it. So amnesia is very convenient. Then you can believe the wonderful rhetoric about how marvelous we are and so on. So let's take more recent history, Iraq, it's, as you said, 20 years. Uh, one of the, there were a lot of vicious, brutal crimes. Iraq is, Iraq may be destroyed forever, may never recover, literally could go into this. The United States may go down in history as the first country that has destroyed uh, a, a relatively prosperous functioning state permanently could happen, could go into it. But let's just take the invasion. There were a lot of crimes and atrocities, as with all invasions. Uh, one of the worst was the marine assault on Fallujah, two of them. Fallujah was a, one of the jewels of Iraq, beautiful city, vacation spot hundreds of mosques, and the United States essentially wiped it out, killed unknown thousands of people. People are still dying from the effects of the uh, heavy weapons that were used, white phosphorus, which burns people to a crisp. Uh, depleted uranium has long-term effects on cancer. The city's a total wreck. Well, we remember it. The US Navy, just commissioned its most recent assault vessel, and it named it the USS Fallujah. 
in memory in commemoration of the marine assault which destroyed Fallujah and one of the worst atrocities of the war. This doesn't get reported in the United States. You want to read about it? You can read Al Jazeera, you know, then you can find out about it. You can find out how Iraqis are reacting to it with great bitterness and anger, of course. But we're immune from that. Happens here, but we have a effective doctrinal system protects Americans from uh, perceiving what their government is doing in their name. So then, along with intellectuals who are willing to repeat the uh, very self-flattering ideology, you can talk about Wilsonian idealism. In fact, the war has been reshaped you look at commentary on Iraq now, the standard version is, including liberal circles, uh, the, it was a failed invasion, it was a mistake, it wasn't done well, but it had noble intentions. The goal was to rescue Iraqis from a really brutal dictator. That's the current story. You look back, it had absolutely nothing to do with what was the invasion. But that's the story. And there's a few small parts missing. Yes, Saddam was a brutal dictator, and the United States strongly supported him through all of his worst crimes. You don't mention that part. The worst crimes were in the 1980s. Chemical warfare, uh, even chemical warfare against Iraqis, killing, poisoning, tens of thousands of people, the Labja massacre, others, US strongly supported it. Don't mention that part. You don't mention the fact that Iraqis were not exactly clamoring for rescue from the country that had devastated them with uh, not only the Bush one war, which destroyed much of the infrastructure, but then Clinton's sanctions, brutal, murderous sanctions so severe that the two international diplomats, distinguished international diplomats who administered them, Dennis Halliday, Hans von Sponek, both resigned in protest because they called the Clinton sanctions genocidal because of the effect that they were having on Iraqis destroying the country. Hans von Sponek wrote an important book about it, giving the details. Americans don't know anything about this. No reviews, no discussion. Uh, what you read is uh, in the New York Times in the 1990s, while this was going on, you read about uh, the, that the uh, Clinton's foreign policy was had a saintly glow uh, uh, with its uh, magnificence. That's what you read. Well, you read the British press during the time of its worst crimes, you find the same thing. That's imperial ideology and the intellectual classes who find a cover for it. So, of course, uh, everybody knows that your background is in linguistics. Nevertheless, you've um, you've been a remarkable commentator on politics, U.S. foreign policy, and the like. Um, so I I would like to hear how you um, I guess explain your connection between uh, your background in linguistics and I guess uh, your interest in these issues. Nothing much. Could be a molecular biologist. I mean, there are intellectually interesting, critically important topics, like trying to understand what kind of creatures human beings are. Our core properties are our possession of language. It's intimately related with the nature of thought to try to reveal what this is. That's one domain. Another domain is what's happening in the world. That's everybody's concern no matter what you are, carpenter, uh, plumber, um, molecular biologist, whatever it may be, 
have a great should have enormous concern with what's happening to our own country, to other countries, to the species in general. Uh, there's some loose connection you can find, but nothing very serious. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, politically, you are very much categorized as being of the left. But I, I get the distinct impression that even though you know, radical as your certain beliefs are, you are very conservative in your temperament. Uh, this is notable in your opposition to, I guess, the certain 1960s new left trends and the Foucaultian postmodernist trends. And I, <clears throat> I'm assuming you have a lot to say in regards to the woke left that is uh, dominating uh, the info uh, information atmosphere these days. So I guess, um, <clears throat> how, how would you reconcile the, I guess, your left-wing views with your conservative uh, temperament, so to speak? Oh, I think, yeah, in fact, uh, I'm perfectly happy to be associated with the the good side. It was a bad side, but with the good side of the Enlightenment, the good side of classical liberalism, lots of very positive developments there. I think uh, uh, we should respect and honor and carry them forward. And with regard to the things you mentioned, I don't see the connection between postmodernism and the left. I mean, it, and what what connection is there between Michel Foucault and the left? I don't see any. Uh, nothing. He uh, he was completely amoral. Didn't thought there was nothing but power systems in the world. That's of course untrue. But uh, I don't see anything particularly left about that. When you talk about what's called wokeism, we have to remember that probably 90% of it is very positive. It's commitment and concern for the rights of oppressed people began with the Afro-American movements. Uh, people have suffered 400 years of bitter, brutal repression, concern for that legacy concern for the rights of women, oppressed minorities, all of that is to the good. Uh, sometimes goes overboard, sometimes in the pursuit of appropriate, proper goals, people go too far, okay? Uh, going too far is a gift to the far right. Then they can pick that up and say, oh, we have to destroy wokeism, meaning destroy compassion, concern for others, uh, uh, opposition to repression and violence. We have to destroy all of that because of this fringe that went too far. That's the genius who's explo exploiting this most fully now is Ron DeSantis in Florida. So let's, uh, so what attitude should we take? We should support the overwhelming part of it, which is quite proper, right, belated, we should advance it. We should criticize the part that goes too far. Okay. So when you start uh, blocking a speech at Stanford University because you don't like the person's uh, political stand, well, we should oppose that. Uh, in the background is a proper concern for the ideas and principles, but the wrong way to deal with this is to block somebody you don't like. Okay, that's a gift to the far right, and they pick it up and run with it. They love it, of course. Then you can get DeSantis, uh, MAGA, and so on. So what we should do, if you call it conservative, it's fine with me, is just take a honest, simple analysis, direct analysis of what's happening, and pursue values which we all uphold, at least in principle. So let's uphold them in practice too. Well, I guess um, a common pushback is that, well, I agree that um, wokeism has humanitarian concerns and ends, but the means that they are, are you know, using in pursuit of that is antithetical to 
classical liberalism. Um, I'm, I mean, for example, they are toppling statues of um, people like David Hume, for example, who's a classical he liberal hero of both you and me. And because of that illiberal means that they are pursuing, they are actually fostering the illiberalism on the right, the Ron DeSantis that you mentioned. Of. And well, you have to be careful of the word they are pursuing. <laughs> There's a fringe that's pursuing that. The large mass are not. The large mass are pursuing the humane and proper ideals. There is a fringe that is going much too far like toppling the statue of David Hume. And that is seized upon by the far right who love it, of course. They, um, if it wasn't, if they, if they could make it happen, they would do it themselves, it's a gift to them. So then you have articles all over the newspapers about how terrible wokeism is and so on. Uh, the underlying message is let's stop all of this compassion, concern, uh, concerned with the rights of others. Let's see if we can kill it all, go back to a nice reactionary, oppressive system by exploiting the fringe that is going much too far, as in examples you mentioned, or in canceling talks and other things. It's a gift to the far right, and they love it. You know? yes. Of course, uh, since we mentioned David Hume, um, I, I believe you spoke in a podcast somewhere, I think it was the Ezra Klein show, that he is your number one uh, most admired philosopher. And I'm very surprised to find out that <clears throat> Adam Smith is also a uh, someone that you greatly admire, um, despite the fact that you, know, you have a lot of negative things to say about, say, capitalism and such. Um, so tell me about your my love for my classical liberalism and how they, human Smith and the like, uh, influence your politics. Didn't influence my politics at all. There are things that Hume and Smith happen to be close friends. Uh, they're outstanding figures. There's a lot of positive things in their work, a lot of very negative things, which I've criticized too. Mm -hmm. So, but, uh, for example, David uh, Adam Smith uh, was pretty strongly in favor of the, uh, the destruction of the commons, the compelling of uh, British uh, 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 yeoman fa farmers, basically, to accept enclosures, to move from a, a society in which people cared for the common property together, turn it into private hands, lead to capitalist exploitation. It was strongly in favor of that. Uh, I don't support that, of course. Primitive accumulations, it's called a brutal process that formed the basis for modern capitalism. Uh, Adam Smith gave advice to the American colonies. Uh, his advice was standard economics. What uh, economists, uh, pretty much what they suggest for the third world today, pursue your comparative advantage. Adam Smith's advice was to the Americans, look, your comparative advantage is production of, of its agriculture, uh, production of raw materials, um, hunting fur, and so on. That's what you're good at. So what you should do in the interest of sound economics, is concentrate on that and buy the advanced manufactured goods from England, but don't try to compete with England in manufacturing. You're not good at that. Well, that's standard advice. Pursue comparative advantage. If the United States had followed it, it would be a third world country. Changing comparative advantage is what's called development. Development changes comparative advantage. So the United States rejected uh, Adam Smith's advice, followed the Hamiltonian principle of high, very high tariffs, protection for uh, new industries, managed to industrialize, became a major industrial power. 
In fact, uh, the United States followed the same policies that England had. England uh, was a backward country uh, in the 17th, 16th, 17th century. The centers of wealth and power were India and China. Well, uh, Britain had the had the guns, uh, the guile, was able to conquer India, deindustrialize it, destroy it, rob its higher technology, uh, impose uh, economic uh, tar high tariffs to keep out superior Indian industry. Well, in England itself developed. Uh, that's how England developed. That's how the United States developed. How Japan developed how all the European countries developed by violating the principles of sound economics. Uh, what we call the third world was the parts of the colonized world which couldn't do this because uh, they were under the control of the imperial powers which prevented. Well, do I admire that in Adam Smith? No, I don't sharply criticize it. Take David Hume great philosopher, uh, had some interesting ideas about political economy. He was one of the first people to understand the enormous power of what we call propaganda, what he called imposing consent to ensure that the mass of the population will agree to be oppressed and exploited instead of overthrowing their rulers. He discussed this. Uh, he himself was quite reactionary. As you read his essay on nationalism, it's shocking. Uh, but uh, so you pick what you don't uh, create icons who you worship. You pick the ideas that are good, you reject the ones that are bad. And uh, do excuse me for. <clears throat> saying that humans may influence your politics, that I meant philosophy. But um, I, I would like to mention like, a couple of other, I guess, in, influences to your philosophy as well. Um, in the same <clears throat> Ezra Klein podcast, you recommended a uh, collection of essays by one, I hope I'm pronouncing his, his name right, Ahad Ha'am. I, I hope that's correct. He's a... He's an early Jewish Zionist thinker, I believe, and and yeah, your recommendation really uh, get me to be curious of his uh, his thought his thoughts. So, um, what can you tell us about him? I didn't catch the name. Oh. I'm reading the transcripts, unfortunately. And I see. Um, uh, Ahad Ha'am. Ahad Ha'am. Oh. Yes. Well, that's a pseudonym. It means one of the people. He was a. a one of the earliest Hebrew essayists, the Hebrew language was just being revived in the late 19th century. It hadn't been spoken language for millennia, practically. Uh, he was one of, there was a revival of the Hebrew language, Hebrew culture. Adam was one of the early uh, exponents, essayists. Uh, he expounded a form of what he called cultural, what was called cultural Zionism. He was a Zionist, but he thought that the goal should be to establish a cultural center in Palestine, which would reinvigorate Jewish life, Jewish culture, Jewish society in the diaspora, and would be a center of learning and culture. Uh, uh, he, he was one of the early early critics, uh, 1906, 1907, said you can't overlook the fact that there is an indigenous population and they have rights, can't just displace and repress them. He wrote essays about this. He's not the only one, but there were few. Well, I think his essays, uh, you know, it's 130 years ago, so doesn't talk about exactly today, but I think they're worth reading. Actually, I kind of grew up with that, mm -hmm. but that's 80 years ago. So um, another book recommendation is uh, one by Andre Schwartz Barth. 
and is titled The Last of the Just. Um, yeah, tell us about that particular novel, how it uh, influenced your thinking. It was written in the late 1950s when nobody was talking about the Holocaust. It was not a topic then. Uh, it's the greatest novel. It's, an, it's kind of a, it's a novel based on history. So it's historical, not exactly a novel, actually covers about a thousand years, but it's building up to the, it's about the Eastern European areas, uh, what's now Poland, Ukraine, and not at that time. Uh, the, it's actually where my parents come from, but then many Jewish immigrants. But uh, it's a discussion of the build up for a thousand years to the monstrosities that finally took place, reached their culmination with the Nazis. The last part of the book is the Nazis, but it's a remarkable evocation, evocation of what the Jewish experience was like in Eastern Europe for a thousand, also partly in the West, but mostly in Eastern Europe for a thousand years uh, with dramatic, uh, uh, remarkable literary talent, but uh, uh, an evocation of the nature of the Holocaust and its background that is unparalleled in my opinion. Yes, and I'm, I mean, the description has tragedy written all over it, which um, brings me to my next question, which is um, in some ways, um, part of the, uh, I guess, the multitude of uh, American foreign policy follies is that, I guess, the American establishment um, have failed to grasp a sense of tragedy. And they, they certainly believe that theirs is a mission of justice. Uh, but they they do not uh, they neglect to look at the fact that most missions that are carried in name of justice and in tragedy. So um, uh, I guess um, uh, I'd like to hear from you how how important is uh, that sense of tragedy um, in I guess in moral philosophy, but also in politics. Depends whether we care about human beings and their fate. If we, if we care about them, we care about those who suffer most. You don't have to care much about people who are living in luxury, doing fine. Yes, you care about their personal concerns. Maybe uh, they're having a problem in their marriage or something. So yes, that's nice. Try to be nice to them. But their people are suffering much worse. And those are the ones we should be caring about, particularly the ones where we have a significant share in the responsibility for their suffering. And crucially, we can alleviate it. That's what matters. We should be asking ourselves, what can we do? So it's fine to be concerned about the people who are being oppressed by a North Korean dictator. Yes, we should be concerned about them, but not a great deal we can do about it. Uh, if uh, you turn to what the UN calls the worst humanitarian crisis in the world, in Yemen, hundreds of thousands of people dying, already dead, facing starvation, uh, miserable conditions. We can do a lot about it. Like we can bring it to an end since most of it is caused by the U.S. funded, armed, uh, directed Saudi military. In fact, remarkably, in the last few weeks, China has intervened and brought about some kind of accommodation between Iran and Saudi Arabia, who are in the background of the fighting and maybe might bring an end to this humanitarian catastrophe. How's the US reacting? By opposing it. Well, those are the kinds of things we should be concerned about. If you want to call it a sense of tragedy, okay. How about just concern for human beings? And that can extend to the homeless people on the streets, 
been the richest, most privileged country in the world. I understand. Um, so imagine ourselves being in the year 2076, which is the 300th anniversary of the founding of the American Republic. Um, what should, what do you think should be uh, featured in the 300 year retrospective of, uh, I guess, the US of A? Well, that's assuming that we make it to 2076, which is by no means certain. We are, go back to the beginning of our conversation, we're facing severe, imminent catastrophes. Okay, let's assume we overcome them. Then at the 300th anniversary, should look back honestly, accurately, record the record of achievement, the record of crimes, plenty of both, look at them honestly, and uh, try to create a kind of under basis of understanding which would lead us to move forward in a more positive direction than has been the case in the past. Yes, and of course, when I say that the US would make it to 2076, I, I was being somewhat optimistic there. But um, I think, um, I think a, a note of optimism should be one to end on. Um, so I'd like to ask you this, what are some of the things which you are optimistic about? Well, what I'm optimistic about are young people who are accepting the serious responsibilities that our gen my generation has left to them to face the coming threats, possible catastrophes, working hard to prevent them. People like uh, in the United States, say the Sunrise Movement, young people who went beyond simply protesting the failure to deal with the environmental crisis, went on to sit in congressional offices, Nancy Pelosi's office, uh, demanding that the government do something. Ordinarily, they would have been thrown out by the Capitol Police, but they were joined by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who came into office on the Bernie Sanders wave, again, with a huge number of young people uh, pursuing efforts to try to save ourselves from the follies of our policies, stayed there, helped institute an environmental program which couldn't get through Congress. Uh, Republicans are 100% opposed, some right-wing Democrats managed to kill most of it, but very important in carrying us to some hope for the future. They're not alone. Extinction Rebellion in England, uh, Global Climate Strike, uh, young people, many others, uh, not just on this issue, but on many other issues. Uh, those are all signs of optimism. Mm -hmm. Well, on that note, thank you very much, Professor Noam Chomsky, for joining the show. You've been very thank generous you. with your time and insight. Good to be with you. Sorry, I have to leave off to the next one. Of course. Uh, take very good care of yourself. Yeah.